killing is everything. Um, and in keeping with this, uh, with his recent killing at the Democratic Convention, um, this being an election season and all, this chapter that I'm about to read um, is fitting. And, and it's truly the next one that I was up to, and, and that's also this shirt. I like that. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, I've been serializing my book for four plus years. Yes, and I still have more to go. We can still do this for another two years the way I'm going yet. And it'll be before it's published. No, I actually sent it to a publisher. We'll see now. God damn it, I've had like two publishing deals come and go. Well, I'm slow and it's not a good thing when you're doing this. But anyway, my book is called Don't Jump and it's a fictionalized memoir and I swear to some of it. And um, okay, so today uh, this chapter is a rare chapter where I actually name names, Ooh, but awesome. um, nobody was injured <laughs> except for our president. No, I'm only kidding. I don't take him down. I don't. I don't. Um, anyway, so Andy is a 35-year-old rock promoter in the early 90s. Look how I have to read from my notes because I don't know what my book's about. And, and, but I don't want to forget what I need to tell you if, in case you don't know. Okay, so she's married to her best friend Lenny, who was her stand-up teacher and is a comedian and a writer, and he's now living the wet dream of just about everybody in his profession. He's the head writer for Rob Holleran, the irreverent hipster host mm. of Variety TV. Mm. Okay, Marty, um, who he replaced, um, is the chilly, condescending previous head writer that recommended Lenny for the gig, but now he wants his records back. Mm. And he holds Lenny in complete contempt. Mm. Inside view from an outsider. When I think back before the end, I believe Lenny and I mutually sealed our fate. In the fall of 2000, he got a call from Lori, a young, ambitious go-getter producer for Holler an Hour. Interested in doing a freebie for the president? The opportunity to meet Bill Clinton, his political hero, and write for him was a dream come true. Celebrating her 50th birthday, Hillary was turning the occasion into a fundraiser for her Senate campaign. Bill used his clout to enlist a passel of celebrities. What Democrat with money wouldn't pay to see Cher, Tom Cruise, Robert De Niro, Gwyneth Paltrow and Ben Affleck back when they were a couple, Chevy Chase and Nathan Lane, plus our most charismatic leader since Kennedy. A couple of weeks before the event, Lenny's press package was delivered to Stewart, the head writer on the project. Before the day's end, he had gotten the gig. An hour or two later, he found out that Marty was Stewart's partner on the project. Interestingly, he hadn't thought to bring Lenny aboard. Interesting, but not surprising. Marty had done a number of side jobs over the years, never hiring Lenny. Considering that Lenny was the person he felt most qualified to replace him at Holler an Hour, it seemed odd. But the bottom line is, because of Marty's recommendation to Holleran, our lives were forever changed. And I guess that should damn well be enough. With some trepidation, Lenny went to the first rehearsal. And as he suspected, Marty virtually ignored him and his ideas. Fortunately, Stewart had no such agenda, and Lenny made his mark. Nathan's monologue ended up containing a load of Lenny's jokes, as did Chevy's and Hillary's. Stewart and he co-wrote a skit that Bill himself did with De Niro. Talk about a friggin' thrill. Mm -hmm. Lenny was allowed a plus one for the big night. Upscale business attire was suggested, as most of the attendees were coming straight from their office. What was a housewife to do? I didn't own a black dress. You know, I was a housewife and a mother, but that was quickly corrected, of course, as soon as the event was over. But I did have a black suit. Not feeling thin or confident enough to wear the skirt, I opted for pants. A sexy top underneath seemed inappropriate for meeting with the president, so I went with a hip, man-tailored, INC, crisp white shirt, buttoned up, respectfully. When I arrived and saw the evening gowns, miniskirts, and peekaboo tops, I realized I misjudged. <laughs> Feeling like Judge Judy in a sea of pants, I quickly undid a few buttons. <laughs> Lenny was given a seat at a table while Stuart and Marty ran around backstage with walkie-talkies. Lenny was not given a VIP pass for the after party after the show. Somehow, all the other writers were. 
As it turned out, the promoter of the event was an old colleague of mine from my rock days, and he had an extra pass to the party and a couple of seats in a limo with Nathan Lane to get us there. The show was a stupendous success. The audience was thrilled to be witnessing this historic, celebrity-laden event. Even the participants were starstruck. There on the stage for the curtain call was Nathan, Chevy, Cher, Gwyneth, Ben, Tom Cruise, Bobby D, and Hillary. Yet no star shined as brightly as old Bill. The man had X factor out the wazoo. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst the lineup of superstars, all eyes were on him. He reaped power, and that was damn sexy to everyone. <laughs> the ride with Nathan to the party was surreal enough. But the sights of the night just kept topping themselves. Ben and Gwyneth were at the bar chatting with a bunch of privileged youth. Cher, still sequined and bejeweled, was sweetly accepting compliments from a fawning middle-aged fan. Hillary, in high spirits, was sharing a toast with a group of powerful supporters. And there, in the midst of it all, was the president. And he was holding court. The reception was for supporters who donated big money. Part of the thank you was a photo with Bill and or Hillary, and as they were always a few feet and a world apart, it was usually one or the other. <laughs> there was a line of New York's elite waiting their turn to have an audience with the most powerful man in the world. Without speaking, Lenny and I drifted in step. Hillary had her own receiving line, not quite as long and made up mostly of serious politicos. As we got closer, I noticed that whoever Bill was speaking to had his undivided attention. They became the most important person in the room for that moment. All eyes were on them, no matter where people pretended to be looking. My heart was racing. My skin was on fire. I knew there was no way I could articulate any words of sense. As warm, smiling eyes welcomed me, I stepped forward. Reaching out my hand, our fearless leader took it warmly in both of his, pulling me close. His left arm reached around my back as, his, he outstretched, as he outstretched his right hand to warmly shake Lenny's. All of this is happening was while we were introducing ourselves, and somehow Lenny had the presence of mind to mention that he'd co-written the sketch that he'd done with De Niro. You, um, and to which Clinton asked, was I okay? Did I do all right? <laughs> you were excellent, Mr. President, said Lenny. What's your name again? Len Blakeman, Mr. President, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> and we believed with certainty. <laughs> Lined up perfectly for the photo op, the shutterbug didn't miss his cue. Bill on my right was holding my hand in his, his left arm still behind me, resting provocatively, very low on my back. <laughs> Lenny was to my left, leaning in. Once the flashbulb popped, the photographer asked our names and handed me an official paper with instructions on how to retrieve our photo. Saying our goodbyes, the president called after us, Len Blakeman, good show. <laughs> Standing a few feet away, relishing the moment, I could have sworn I saw old Bill giving a wink. <laughs> what a charmer. <laughs> Seconds later, we ran into Marty and Sheila. Mm -hmm. I'd met Sheila casually a couple of times at stand-up one-nighters and holler and holler holiday parties. Some years older and very funny, she'd had some success, but had sort of leveled off. As with many comics, in real life, she was fairly serious. I always felt less than around her and Marty, and their dismissiveness around me seemed to suggest they liked it that way. Huh. Feeling a little smug that night, having just had a close encounter of the most intense kind, I had something that Marty and Sheila coveted. Even though my tone was sweet and friendly, they were smart. I'm sure they could sense my na 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 <laughs> It was before I acquired a taste for humble pie and learned to savor its bitter sweetness. For Lenny and I, the night topped off an all-time high of happiness, togetherness, excitement, and fulfillment, and where I suspect we overstepped our mark. Not only did Len get the gig without Marty's knowledge or consent, he ended up writing a lot of the funniest stuff in the show, not the least of which was done by Clinton himself. We'd had an audience with the man, something Marty and Sheila hadn't managed, and the photographer who'd shot them with Hillary had given them the official paper so they could retrieve their photo. Marty was forced to fax me for the information. 
It was literally the first time in all the years I knew him that he even acknowledged my presence on the planet. And I don't think he used my name then either. <laughs> we added insult to further injury by using our presidential photo as our Christmas card that day. <laughs> <laughs> Sending it to everyone we knew. <laughs> Some unknown guy holding a cocktail appeared in our photo with the president, and unbeknownst to us at the time, Hillary was off to the right, so she too gra graced our picture. The caption read, Happy Holidays from Bill, Andy, Lenny, Hillary, and the guy on the left. <laughs> at the Hollering, yes, I write fiction. <laughs> Uh, where am I? Okay. Um, at, the Holler, uh, at the Holler and Christmas party a few days later, where our card with Clinton was one of the hot topics, the tension between Marty, Sheila, and us was palpable. That was also the night, for the very first time, that Holler and wanted nothing to do with me. There would be no smile, no hand kissing, and no compliments. I tried to comfort myself thinking that it wasn't personal, that he was just in one of his moods but he never warmed up to me or Lenny again. His birthday was no exception. Having caught sight of himself in an unflattering light one night, easy to do on television, which adds 10 pounds to everyone and 20 to me, <laughs> Holleran had taken control of his diet with the same discipline he applied to everything in his life. Even though he, begun, he began eating the same small meals every day and structured his intake to an obscene degree, Rob loved food. He rarely allowed himself to deviate from his healthy menu. But it had become a ritual for Christmas and his birthdays that I try to surprise him with some of his favorite foods. As rarely as he went to restaurants, he hadn't been to some of the best. The first year, I took a cab to Peter Luger's in Brooklyn. Mm. The steak and accoutrement mm. are without comparison. Mm. I pre-ordered the meal, telling them who it was for, knowing that would guarantee it would be the best of their already best. I timed it, so I arrived at the studio just as Holleran was finishing the night's taping. Seized chocolates, which I had expressed east, served as dessert. With his assistant's help, I set out the meal and left. Moments later, Lenny's office phone rang. Why don't you and Andy come on down? Hollering himself offered. That was huge. In his private dining room, Rob, his executive producer, and his assistant awaited us to join them. Another year, knowing he loved Japanese food and ne never been to Nobu, I called my old friend Drew, formerly a manager at the cafe, now a world-famous restaurateur, soon to be a James Beard Award winner. He helped me arrange a banquet, and again, I picked it up by taxi and had it set out just as the day's taping wrapped. Holleran talked about it for months afterwards. <laughs> My last foray into culinary pleasure was to have live Maine lobsters flown in that morning, delivered at lunchtime. Holleran had them taken to a local restaurant and steamed. Other than the requisite thank you card that I got from his assistant, there was no other mention of it. I knew something was amiss. Holleran had always been very gracious and appreciative. It didn't take long for the freeze to find its way home. Lenny was out in the cold, and it was following him everywhere. For the most part, Holleran was strictly business. On the occasional night when Lenny could make him laugh, he'd come home so joyful. Those nights were infrequent and dwindling. Lenny was feeling smaller and smaller. It didn't do much for his self-esteem or his temper. Being snapped at all day perpetuated his behavior at night. The only comfort Lenny got was from the old Mary Jane and the computer. He'd amassed a huge email list of supported fans that he'd send jokes, political rants, and forwards to. It became a thing to be included. The people that requested to be added to his list cons constantly amazed me. There were producers, celebrities, agents, executives, intellectuals. They piled praise and gratitude on Len for the Daily Funny. It was the only appreciation he was getting in those days, and he used it more and more like a drug to ease the pain and disappointment. Losing ground with Holleran was killing his ego, his heart, and his soul. It didn't do much for our marriage either. I lost him to the computer, the pot, and the sadness. Thanks. Mm -hmm.